in our last two studies, as we make our way into the introduction, basically, of, of the book of Ephesians, we looked at the introduction and saw that Paul was writing under the direction of the Holy Spirit with a message to the faithful in Christ Jesus. In other words, the things contained in the book of Ephesians is directed directly to the saints because they, Paul's teaching in the book of Ephesians uh, is deep and uh, it's the meat of the word. So when the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, the city had one main claim to fame and it was the site of an enormous temple to Artemis. This was a building that was known throughout the ancient world. And people would travel for days to be able to see uh, that temple, the temple of Artemis. And it was obviously a humongous tourist attraction. In their temple worship, the Ephesians looked back in history and they spoke of a meteorite that fell from the sky and hit the earth and was eventually shaped into the form of the idol of Artemis, which they was in the temple of Artemis. So Paul, on the other hand, looked past history. He looked into the origins of the universe. And so right there at the beginning of time, he saw God skillfully, and purposely planning for the coming of the church. There was no mention of the church in the Old Testament. Paul said it was a mystery that was hidden from the Jews. So this week we're going to look at what I think is one of the probably more confusing time. There's a set of glasses under that chair right there. If, so if, if any of you can't see, your glasses is under that chair right there. Yeah, I see that, Brian. If you need an extra pair of glasses, you just put those on. And, and uh, oh, yeah, that, that'll do it right there. I didn't mean to stop right in the middle of what I was doing, but I saw some glasses, <laughs> and I thought somebody's going to step on somebody's glasses, but we won't know it because we don't know who they belong to. I'll try them on in a minute and see if they're any better than these right here. If they do, I'll just take them home with me too. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It could be. So we're going to look at uh, the doctrine of predestination and election. This doctrine has divided denominations into other denominations because it, there is so much confusion about what is taught about the doctrine of election and predestination. And because of this confusion, preachers preach things that's not exactly biblical. So we're going to study this doctrine together tonight. And I'm, I'm going to try my best not to wipe my nose off. I'll just wipe it ever so often. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul gives us the foundation for the doctrine of election and predestination. We talked about it this morning. Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, 
having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> Paul explained how this doctrine of election and predestination works. And if you take the preachers out of the way, it's simple. It's not hard to understand. So we're going to look at the doctrine of election and predestination, and we need to understand that it's not just a New Testament doctrine. It is a doctrine that was taught throughout the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, the Bible said, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than other people, for you were the fewest of all nations, but because the Lord loved you. Hosea chapter 11, verses 7, 8, and 9 reminds us, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the, to the Most High, none at all exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. So the problem that we have when we start thinking about the doctrine of election and predestination is that we have no other choice but to look at this thing from a human perspective because that's what we are. And so then we try to ex explain it and understand it from a human perspective instead of trying to see it from a divine perspective. From this viewpoint, Hosea chapter 11, verse 7 said, My people are bent on backsliding from me. In verse 8, he asked a question, How can I give you up? Verse 9, he says, I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. This is almost exactly the same thing that is we're told in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, where God said, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Whether the nation of Israel or whether it's our own election, love is the basis for the doctrine of election and predestination. You have to understand that. Romans chapter 9 verse 15 says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So can I hold that thought for a minute? Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself because the Lord loved you. John 3.16 is more familiar with us than any other proper scripture in the Bible. So that's, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, we are told, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Many of us, many people have been taught that the cross is the greatest symbol of God's love in our Christian experience. But I want you to think of this for a moment. When Christ died on the cross, the world was already populated. Human misery was well known by experience. Poverty called out for help. Hunger called out for food. The sick called out for healing. Orphans called out for love. The mentally ill called out for help and understanding. 
But most of all, sin demanded a Savior. When God so loved the world, there was nothing to call out for the plight of man but the desire of God to love humanity. God loved humanity before there was ever a man because God knows the ending before the beginning ever starts. So when God so loved the world, the Bible had already had a plan. There was nothing out to call out for the plight of man. But the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he indeed was foreordained, speaking of Christ, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, it's not hard for us to comprehend the doctrine of election when we understand this great truth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so it's because God is not willing that any should perish, that the Spirit of God calls and woos and pleads with the human heart. He calls men to be saved all because of the fact that God so loved the world. And I think sometimes we, we forget that, that it's God's will for all men everywhere to be saved, the Bible says in, in Paul's writing to Timothy. So if it's God's will for men to be saved, why would he make it hard? You understand? He made it simple for men to be saved, so simple that those kids that, that you see being baptized for the last three or four Sundays can understand their need for salvation. Why? Because God made it simple. The truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, is that, that men have made it hard. Preachers have made it hard. Denominations have made it hard. But God didn't require us to jump through any hoops. He just simply said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. He made it simple. Predestination is a great doctrine when it's probably understood <clears throat> for its revelation of God's love for his own. In, it includes every act of providence in protecting and guiding the Christian from the new birth until we go into heaven's glory. Verses 7, 12, and 13 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Here's the plan of salvation. It is so simple right here. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul said, this is, this is how this thing works. So he gave us some things that we can use to help better understand the doctrine of election and predestination. Paul says those who heard the word of truth, that is the gospel, and trusted in Christ, that is when they believed what they heard about Christ, then he says they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, the Bible very clearly teaches us that predestination for heaven comes to those who have been born again, blood-washed saints of God. Therefore, Ephesians chapter 1 gives us these 10 characteristics. I'm going to try to give you all 10 of them, and then if I have to cut some of them short, I'll do that. Uh, First of all, we have trusted Christ as our personal Savior and blessed with every spiritual blessing. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It's sad that many believers live in insecurity, not praising God for the good things that they already possess in Christ Jesus. Sometimes the world sees us as poor, naive, ill-equipment. But according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, we can be confident that we can do anything through Christ who gives us the strength and the power to do so. Secondly, we are holy and blameless, having been chosen 
in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Verse 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It is the will of God that all men everywhere be saved and live a life that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus. And so many believers who don't understand this wonderful doctrine will live with a gnawing sense of guilt feelings that they have to earn their forgiveness, that they have to earn God's acceptance or belonging through good works. They can obtain God's favor. All of that's not true. God loves us just like we are. He accepts us just like we are. The third thing, we have been adopted as his sons and daughters, deserving all of the privileges of being in his eternal family. Verse 5 says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. As believers, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We no longer live as slaves to sin, but we're made through, uh, free through the blood of Christ on the cross. Unfortunately, too many believers are living under the stress, strain, and imprisonment of sin because they don't understand the fact that we have authority over sin, sickness, Satan, and all of the trash that he brings in our life. The fourth thing is we live primarily for the praise of his glory. Verse 6 says to praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Our greatest purpose, joy, and sense of fulfillment comes through praising and pleasing the Lord in everything. Does that mean that we aren't going to make mistakes? No, we are. We're going to mess up. We're going to make stupid decisions, and we will until Jesus comes again. Yet there are carnal believers who think that their great purpose is gained through their own selfish satisfaction. Yet Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whatever you do in word or do, do all for the glory of God. So as we praise God for his attributes, we are infused. Other words, when we praise him, he fills us up with more revelations of himself. The more we praise him, the more Holy Spirit reveals things, the deep things of God. Paul Peter put it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by those he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that we might become partakers of the divine nature having escaped corruption that is in this world by lust. So Paul says, and Peter echoes this, they say the same thing in different ways, and that is that when you were born again, you received a divine nature. So we have a divine nature. Now, now listen, let me tell you something. We said, you've heard it said a million times. We're just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, let me tell you what. I was a sinner and I got saved by grace and now I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. I have a divine nature because that is one of the gifts of our salvation. So we need to understand who you are in Christ if you ever understand who you are in Christ, you'll stop whining about the fact that you're just an old stinking sinner saved by grace, a worm in the dirt. Well, I'm sorry, that's not true. So the fifth thing is we enjoy being eternally redeemed, that is purchased, bought back from condemnation through his blood. Verse 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to to the riches of his grace. As believers, we have the privilege of replacing anger, hurt, pain, fear, and feelings of rejection 
for the rich grace that's found in the loving arms of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 32, in that long passage of Scripture, to make a conscious choice to replace our anger and jealousy and wrath and fear and feelings of pain for the compassion, encouragement, and affection, consolation of love and fellowship of the Spirit found in Christ Jesus. Number six, we are equipped with great wisdom and insight. Verse eight says, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. James chapter one, verse five says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberty, liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Because God wants each of us to reach our full potential, he generously gives us wisdom and knowledge and discernment. We have to understand that. And, and that wisdom and knowledge and discernment is propped up through the Word of God. That's where we get our wisdom and knowledge and discernment is in this book. And so the sad thing about it is that most believers today don't have a clue what this book says. Number seven, we have an understanding into the mysteries of God's great will. Verse nine says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, in Christ Jesus. This is the same thing Paul said, but it, as it is written, <clears throat> I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared, prepared for us who love him. Most preachers stop right there. And this is a passage of scripture they use at funerals. And they talk about we can't comprehend what heaven's like because Paul said, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's verse 9. There is another verse. Verse 10 says, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. No wonder Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11, This I pray that your love would abound still more and more in real knowledge and depth of insight that you may discern what is best, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. So God has given us the ability through his word and through the teaching and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to understand the mysteries of God. Now, there's some things that God's never going to reveal to us because it's not our business. It's none of our business. But here's the thing is God has given us the tools to understand the deep things of God, the mysteries of God. And it's sad that we aren't using them. Number eight, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ Jesus. Verse 11 says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, even though the world thinks that we are a bunch of fanatics or extremists or second-class uh, simpletons, we can be assured that he is working out his will in us and through us as rich inheritors of his nature, of his power, and his spirit. Number nine, we are brought under Christ's authority Christ's protection, and Christ's responsibility. Verse 10 says, and this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. It is the will of God for Christians to be strong, to be bold, to walk in the authority that we have been given in the name of Jesus, in the word of God, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. There's coming a day when every knee will bow and will honor Christ 
as the Lord of glory. Number 10, we have been given the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Children of God need to see ourselves as empowered, as equipped, as enabled by the power of their resident Holy Spirit. You remember that we talked about the anointing comes from within, not from above. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit residing in us, and he is the anointed one. Okay? So we've been, we've been given the Holy Spirit. What a great joy to know that through his marvelous grace and determination that through his great love he has established a plan whereby we constantly walk under his divine watch care. No wonder Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's got enough of stuff to worry for its, for its own self. So, the, you know, he says, hey, look at those birds out there. You know, they, they don't worry. He, he said, look at that grass. Grass don't worry. He said, well, grass can't worry. I don't know if grass can worry or not. Jesus said it didn't worry. He said, you, because it's cut up, it grows one day, cut up, bundled up, and they use it as, as fodder in fireplaces and in their stoves. Jesus said, don't you think you're more important than birds and grass and worms? Well, sure. We, sure we are. You know why? Because we're, we're God's kids. We're an heir of God, a joint heir of Christ. And we need, we need to get that in our head. We need to understand who we are in Christ. Once we begin to buy into this biblical truth of who we are in Christ Jesus, it will change your entire perspective, not just of life in general, but in your Christian walk with God. We are somebody. We are somebody. We are somebody. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. That's pretty good news right there. Amen? Amen? Well, I, I really kind of rushed through some of that because I thought it was going to take me longer than it did. But the good news is you get out 20 minutes early. So you have to wait for your youngins to get over here. 